There's a scene in Martin Scorsese's masterful, massive magnum opus, Killers of the Flower Moon, that I haven't been able to stop thinking about. Actually, let me qualify that statement. The whole movie has been on my mind constantly ever since I first saw it. There are so many scenes that elicit horror, reflection, speechlessness. Sometimes all three occur at once. But the particular scene I'm thinking of comes very late into the film. It comes after the murders, after the lies, after the house of cards built by William Hale has begun to crash down. But immediately before the bracelets start coming out and the principal villains of this story start to see the world through the bars of cells. The federal investigators involved with unraveling the reign of terror meet at night by the Osage's oil derricks so that they can each discuss their individual findings as a group in secret. The glow of flames appears on the horizon, brightens the night sky from a couple miles away. That's coming from Hale's Ranch, one investigator notes. I just sold him fire insurance, another remarks. The fire, a burn-off being overseen by Hale, appears to be the insurance scheme that the agents presume it to be, set and run out of control with no apparent motivation. We see Hale's workers through the fire, first with the growing flames merely existing in between our eyes band them, but eventually the flames rage and soar so high that we can only see a blurred, distorted image of the machinations behind the fire, the heat waves so dense that the lens of the camera can barely penetrate them to reveal those who stand behind them. It is an act of violence which obfuscates those responsible for it. The fire grows and rages so great that it makes the nearby home of Ernest Burkhart, Hale's nephew and his wife, Molly, in Osage, illuminate. Burkhart has just given Molly a dose of poison disguised as insulin, as ordered by her doctors, subservient to Hale, with the aim of slowly killing Molly over time, and has himself downed a pittance of the poison as some sort of vile penance. Before he submits himself to the bed he and his wife share, the fire looming in the distance, yet also too close for comfort. Keep this in mind, we're gonna circle back here in a bit. Every April, millions of tiny flowers spread over the Blackjack Hills and vast prairies in the Osage Territory of Oklahoma, from Johnny Jump Ups to Spring Beauties and Little Bluets. The Osage writer John Joseph Matthews observed it as a galaxy of petals, which make it look as though the gods had left confetti. In May, when coyotes howl beneath an unnervingly large moon, taller plants such as spiderworts and black-eyed Susans begin to creep over the tinier blue stealing their light and water. The necks of the smaller flowers break and their petals flutter away, and before long, they are buried underground. This is why the Osage refer to May as the time of the flower-killing moon, a metaphor for how the Osage were overrun, victimized, and killed by people who swarmed over their land in ruthless pursuit of power and wealth. The Osage nation became the richest people in the world per capita thanks to oil found underneath their land, land they had been forced to moved to by the white colonial United States government. They suffered and a miracle arose afterward, yet in classic American fashion, the white man tried to take it away from the Osage still to steal their good fortune after forcing them to suffer some more. The Osage never prayed for a great life, just for life itself. The life of the adults and elders is done. They need to preserve the future for their children. They must fight back. If this was like the old days, they could fight off the wolves like they used to, but the enemy is using more nefarious tactics. They've become wolves in sheep's clothing. They're exploiting the complacency of strangers. For much of his career, Martin Scorsese has told stories centered around morally compromised, at best, often downright despicable individuals. What makes Ernest Burkhart so different is that we know he's a horrible weakling right from the jump. We cling to some twisted hope that at some point he'll grow a spine, that he'll do the right thing and come clean with the Osage, who he's married into because he loves his wife, Molly. But it's also doubtful whether or not he actually loves Molly. The answer perhaps can be found in a final exchange he has with Molly long after the fires have gone out, long after everything has collapsed around him. His confession to cleanse his soul with his strong and silent wife acting as a deliberator. He has every opportunity to tell all, to say the right thing and set the record straight. Does it make everything right? No, nothing could, but it could have counted as a step towards absolving himself 
of his sins. For the most part, he is honest. However, when presented with the question of what he was injecting Molly with under the guise of treating her diabetes, when asked to confess to the act he committed, which most directly harmed his wife, he freezes and just says, insulin. He toes the line of his uncle and doctors. He'll sell out everything and everyone else who partook in the reign of terror, will admit to having a hand on the wheel of the crimes and murders, but the second he has to reconcile with actually having his fingerprints on an act, he can confess no more. He refuses to confront the reality that, while not always directly, he contributed to the deaths of innocent, peaceful people who welcomed him into their lives, accepted him as one of their own, and offered him and his family nothing but love. They treated him like an actual member of the family, as opposed to his uncle and brother who just manipulated him. There's almost a split persona inside of Ernest. He recognizes this is all wrong, but deludes himself otherwise. He's weak and fragile. Perhaps it's just who he is, a greedy, expandable simpleton. But perhaps there's something deeper, an insecurity from having gone off to war, relegated to being a cook because of a medical condition. He couldn't fight in the trenches and felt inferior as a result. There is no point, however, where Ernest is weaker or more powerless than as he lays back in his bed while that scorching fire blazes out of control in the distance, deep into a literally poisoned marriage which exists at odds with his supposed love for his spouse. It's a moment which echoes another of the great masterful American westerns, Days of Heaven. In Malick's intimate epic, it's an outbreak of locusts, leaping into the skies and obscuring the principal characters at the heart of its story, just like the flames of Bill Hale's Sham of a Fire. And just as it seems the farm workers in Days of Heaven have gained the upper hand against the locusts, as the fire pit they've built to destroy them does its job, suddenly embers leap. A piece of farm machinery veers off course, and now there's a wildfire on the farm. The titular farmer, played by Sam Shepard, is caught amidst a twisted love triangle designed to scheme him out of his money after he passes away. Eerily mirrors the conspiracy to eradicate Molly and her family and the Osage people. He can't think straight. Everyone can barely see anything beyond the flames. He angrily demands that they let it burn. And it proves to be the beginning of the end for the farmer, as the fire was the beginning of the end for Ernest Burkhart, caught in a poisoned marriage manipulated by William Hale. And it was all because Ernest didn't have the spine to speak out, to do something, to not live in a state of complacency. This is a problem we continue to face as a country today. So many of us are afraid to get involved for whatever reason, whether it's because we don't want to make a scene or because it goes against some higher belief that we may have. But just like that fire, if it's not nipped in the bud immediately, if we just let it rage uncontrollably until it burns everything down, nothing will be left but ash, and eventually it'll come for us too. This film is Scorsese's meditation on our society being content with how things are, with this sense of conformity, of not being accepted, and how that drives people like Ernest and his actions, even though they know it's wrong and are making things worse, they've deluded themselves into thinking that no, we're following the right orders, the laws, the regulations, the structure that is laid before us is the right thing, how could we go against it, instead of questioning why things are the way they are. It's something we've seen a lot in his spiritual and religious musings, specifically in films like Silence or The Last Temptation of Christ. And I feel like Scorsese framing Killers of the Flower Moon through his Catholic guilt lens made for a far more effective and emotionally resonant film than if anyone else had really told the story. Now, that's not to say Scorsese is the only one who could have told this story. Obviously, I think at a certain point in time, Time, the Osage need to tell their own story about the account, but as an outsider, I think Scorsese found a way in that treated the victims of this story with respect while condemning the oppressors, and really all of us who are complacent in injustices continuing to go on in our world. Now when it comes to William Hale, I think Hale knew exactly what he was doing, and just understood 
how to manipulate people. But the same inferiority complex which degrades Ernest makes him so susceptible to his uncle's influence exists within him too. It's present, in fact, in most all of the white characters committing this genocide against the Osage. It speaks to a larger systemic issue. There is this widespread belief in the 1920s that white people deserve to be dominant across the globe, to have power and impose their will onto anyone who is different to them. What makes it interesting is that when the settlers originally came to America and as more people began to immigrate to the country, you get the sense that the white people felt as though they didn't belong. They aren't the indigenous population and therefore, in theory, are the minority. But through systemic manipulation and outright genocide, they place themselves in actual tangible positions of oppressive power so as to reinforce their delusions. Scorsese brilliantly dissects white insecurity, how we have this incessant need to control and grasp for power because we really didn't belong on this continent. There's such a great contrast between the Osage as people, a community, and the white would-be conquerors looking to take over. The Osage hold a deep love and respect of one another. They are an almost non-violent people who trust and treat each other as equals. Their spirituality has made them grateful for what they have. In the case of the white people, on the other hand, they resent someone else's happiness and success and feel it should belong to them because what do the Osage know what to do with it? It's so toxic and rotten to its core. Bill and his cohorts don't even really have respect for one another, as their greed does not merely extend to the Osage. They'll use one another, throw whoever they need to under the bus if it means advancing themselves. This is what makes the runtime of Killers of the Flower Moon so, so goddamn effective. The movie is long. Yes, it feels like a three and a half hour long movie the same way Lawrence of Arabia or Heaven's Gate both feel like one. All three films deal with Western colonialism and white arrogance. It's burdensome by design. It requires a massive scope in order to cover the intricate ways in which these imperialist plans are implemented. But each film also centers itself on a particular point of view, forces us to contend with some form of torment. I've also seen remarks from Osage consultants on the film about the way Killers of the Flower Moon centers its point of view. And I think it's absolutely fair to insist that Molly should have been been at the center of the story. I would never presume to know how the story of the Osage should be told better than an actual Osage says so. What I would say is that, to me, Molly is the heart and soul and center of this whole thing, even if her screen time alone doesn't necessarily reflect that. The encroaching ugliness of the film, that which culminates in that ugly, evil fire, is reflected through her eyes, and her journey of recovery is intrinsically entwined with the dismantling of Bill Hale's power and villainy. Molly is ultimately the one who exercises agency in cutting Ernest loose at the end, but that's my point of view of Molly's role in the story, and I can certainly concede that it's bolstered by what a powerhouse Lily Gladstone is in this role. Her silence is deafening, confidence palpable. Molly is in control the entire time and has the resilience and strength to endure and fight, and that's how she's able to push through. She takes all the adversity thrown at her and continues to act with kindness in her heart and march for what's right, pleading to the US government to not turn a blind eye to their situation. But Christopher Cote said something else that I also agree with, which is that Martin Scorsese can only tell so much of the story, and it's really up to an indigenous filmmaker, or more specifically, an Osage filmmaker, to tell the story from the Osage's point of view. If Scorsese, or any white filmmaker, came in and tried to tell their story, he wouldn't be doing it justice. It would lack specificity and ring hollow as a result. I think Scorsese came into this with a conscious knowledge of that, and so decided to hone in on Molly as a character first, and an Osage second. My favorite part about this is that Scorsese almost acknowledges it, especially in the end with the very self-aware breaking of the fourth wall ending. When Scorsese comes out on stage and delivers the closing remarks of the radio play, sanctioned by the FBI no less, 
He's acknowledging the folly in what he was trying to accomplish with the story initially, prior to rewriting it to include more of the Osage's perspective. But more than that, that moment, which stands as one of Scorsese's crowning achievements insofar as an individual scene is concerned, shows us the trivialized, whitewashed version of what the FBI has documented in the history books, and takes the idea of a true crime story and exposes it for what it is, a sanitization, a sensationalized exploitation, a reductive reimagining. These things only carry weight when they're treated delicately, with humanity and soul. Absolutely profound storytelling, the beginning of a larger conversation and the opening of a door that's been closed for entirely too long. Ernest being the person that he is, coming from the upbringing and background that he does, is someone who needs to be directed, needs to be pointed in a direction and told to march. He's not acting with his humanity in mind, he's not really even thinking about what it is he's doing, even if he's feeling something different. The times in the film when you see him the most shaken up are the times when we've seen him witness the aftermath of his going along with the reign of terror, with being complacent and not speaking out. The corpses, the bloodshed, and sorrow of his actions. There's a sense of guilt and recognition on his part, and yet? he continues to deny his own humanity in order to uphold a dogma and figurehead that's directed and guided him, told him the steps, and appeared to have his best interests in mind. Essentially, he's plagued with Catholic guilt, and yet refuses to absolve himself of it. Molly continues to offer him the luxury of trust, love, and loyalty because he's human and they have feelings for one another, until the moment he denies her to her face. At that moment, it becomes clear to her that he'll never understand. He'll never have the courage to speak out, to go against the order. He will live in a purgatory of complacency for the rest of his life, puzzled by the fact that he took the steps required of him and yet is damned because of it. But we knew long before that. We knew as that fire burned and Ernest watched from afar and he wept and he took droplets of the poison he gave Molly before giving her another final dose as prescribed. The fire in Days of Heaven culminated in the murder of the farmer, a brief life on the run as a wanted killer and finally a suicide by cop. And then nothing. A love triangle erased from time, burned to the ground forever, save for perhaps the chance at a future for a woman and a young girl. In Killers of the Flower Moon, this all took the same course, and ultimately, there was no mention of the murders.